everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who've just popped in, my name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day, and I am so excited. We are launching a brand new program this year, our World War I webinar series with the United States World War I Centennial Commission. And I am so excited to be here with Dr. Michael Nyberg from the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I want to do a couple little quick pieces of housekeeping and then I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Nyberg. A couple things just so you kind of know what's coming. Structure for tonight, it's a little housekeeping. Number one, the structure is we're gonna focus on content first and pedagogy second. Um, we'll get a little bit about some of the content connecting to some of the readings and the primary and secondary sources you've been looking at over the last three and a half weeks. At that point, we're gonna turn things over to questions. Now, I want you to ask questions as they come up. Just go ahead to the question box and enter them. Couple things to know. I am the only one who sees the question box. Please don't worry about a question not being a good question. Trust me, if you have it, others do too. When you think about it, put it in there. That helps me so that if Dr. Nyberg's talking and several of you have the same question, I know to pause him and ask it. I may also save some for the end, uh, so feel free to do that at any time. Um, another thing to note, while you've got our cameras on right now, we can't see you. So please don't stress if your kids are in the room or if you've got uh, finishing your dinner. One thing that is really, really important, at the end of the program, there's going to be a survey link. It's really, really important that I need to ask you to fill that out. I'll blast it out to you uh, and I'll give it to you so you can copy and paste it right in your browser. Uh, we want to do that for two things. One is the World War I Centennial Commission is really interested in metrics and numbers. And it's really important that we capture as many of those numbers and your feedback on the program right away. This is a new program. We're going live. And one of the things we want to be able to do is edit and tweak as we go step by step. Uh, one other fun thing I'm going to mention, if you've been watching NHD social media, because I know that's what you do for fun too, uh, we have a new program for the summer of 2019. This was just put out yesterday, a program we're calling Memorializing the Fallen. This is an opportunity for 18 teachers to study World War I, uh, both online this winter and live in person in Europe next summer. Please, if you have any interest in this, please check it out. Uh, the shortcut is www.nhd.org slash WWI. It'll redirect you here. You can learn more about the program. We're going to be traveling with 18 amazing educators next year at the end of June. Applications open yesterday. They're due November 1st. So check it out. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, we, you know, I've seen a lot of really good work and interesting work on the discussion boards. I'd love to see some of you apply for this really cool opportunity. Okay, I have gone ahead and talked enough. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my camera off and give us just a second here. I'm gonna give control of the screen over to Dr. Michael Nyberg from the U.S. Army War College to talk about the outbreak and the causes and the why of World War I. So, Dr. Nyberg, take it away. Thank you, Lynn. I actually can't see the PowerPoint, so I'm not sure if I've done something wrong there. That's okay. Give us just a second here. We All can right. see your screen. Do you just, can you pull the PowerPoint up for you or do you need me to pull it back to me? Um, I don't see so I, I guess I go. Just go I'm ahead and fine. open up the PowerPoint on your end. If not, we can pull it back to me and I'll control it. Okay, why don't we try it that way? Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for uh, for being here. Um, I'm gonna just take a second just to get this PowerPoint loaded up. While we're, oh, there we go. So, I have to, so can I control that now, Lynn? Uh, it's controlled on my screen, so just tell me when to move forward. Okay, we'll do it that way. Um, anyway, and thank just, you all for- I'm sorry, your camera is on, just so you know. Let's turn that off. All right, excellent. Okay, uh, what I wanna do with you all here tonight is to take a look at the causes of the First World War, the outbreak of the First World War. Um, I probably should explain a little bit of the reason that I uh, did this project, this, the, the book on which this talk is, is based. Um, I, I come from a background that is really more social history than it is military history, which is to say that um, I'm much more interested in societies than I am in kind of elite leaders and, um, diplomats, statesmen, things like that. So what I was really interested in doing, the fundamental question that I had when beginning this project was, how would this moment of 1914 look different 
if I got away from the same 14 or 15 people that we always study when we look at 1914, what would look different if I took it from a more social and cultural viewpoint? And so that's the fundamental question that I wanted to ask here. And along the way, I had a secondary question that I wanna ask. And Lynn, if you can flip the slide, we can get into that. What I wanted to do was kind of challenge the way that we typically think about the First World War in the United States, if we think of it at all. And if we think of it at all, there are kind of three tropes I think that we use. And one is captured just so beautifully in the uh, satirical newspaper, The Onion. Uh, this is from their desk calendar, Our Stupid Century, Our Dumb Century. And this is the entry for the First World War. And as you can see here, it says war declared by all. Austria declares war on Serbia, declares war on Germany, da 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 da. Ottoman Empire almost declares war on itself. And in the bottom right hand corner, it says area drunkard declares war on Ireland. So this is uh, this is one trope that we have of this kind of silly war uh, that just kind of broke out because it was a time of, you know, really stupid people doing really stupid things. There's also a headline there that says assassination of Archduke spreads fear at Archduke convention. So a humorous approach to this. Lynn, can you do the next one, please? The second thing that we sometimes use comes from Blackadder, the BBC TV series, if any of you are familiar with it. Uh, this is a still from the last episode of the show. This is Captain Edmund Blackadder there in the center, uh, played by the very talented British actor Rowan Atkinson. It is the last offensive that this unit is gonna undergo. Uh, we know that it's the Passchendaele Offensive of the summer of 1917, a very bloody, very disastrous offensive. Uh, and he says he's an old time uh, British Army veteran from the old colonial wars. And he says he's going to get out of this offensive by putting a pair of underpants on his head, sticking two pencils up his nose and claiming that he's gone crazy. And the trope here, the reason this works is because the assumption that the BBC makes is your root for Blackadder, because even though he seems crazy, he is, in fact, the sanest man going in the Western Front. So, again, this kind of trope of insanity. And then the final one, please, Lynn. This is a still from the movie, Oh, What a Lovely War, which came out on the 50th anniversary of the First World War in 1964. Uh, this is the actor playing Sir Douglas Haig standing in front of rows and rows of crosses in a cemetery. So this kind of image that we have of this war somehow being more wasteful, more stupid, harder to explain uh, than a wars that came before and after. And I think this has bled over to the way that we teach the war. So Lynn, if you could go to the next one, please. Um, we teach this war through what, what, what historians call structural explanations, and I'm sure many of you have seen this in your own classes or have used it. Uh, this is what we call the, the main. I know that you've all kind of taught this. Uh, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Uh, it's an easy thing to teach, I think, for three reasons, and I think it, there's a reason why we teach it. One is that it has that nice mnemonic device that allows us to understand this war uh, or allow us to teach it, excuse me, uh, through something that hopefully students will recall. This image that is the background is the founding of the German Empire in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles in 1871. So you can teach a kind of nice narrative that starts in 1871 and ends in 1919 when the French declare the end of, uh, the Allies declare the end of the First World War in that exact same room. So you can do that kind of 48 or so, 50 year or so arc. I also think we teach it this way because we can sort of lull ourselves into believing that if we don't live in a world with militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, as they existed in 1914, then we can go to bed at night thinking that the causes of World War I really aren't that relevant to the modern day. So my first point here, my first kind of thesis to you, is that the reason we teach the First World War the way we teach it actually has very little to do with the reasons why the First World War broke out. It has to do with the ways that we remember the war. It has to do with the ways that we want to remember the war. So what I wanna do with you is kind of blow up that, that main system, explain to you why I think that won't work, explain to you why a couple of other things I think won't work, and then explain the rather more complex thing that actually does happen in 1914. Next slide, please. So this is a, a homework exercise that, that we actually, students actually did here in, uh, in our high school, local high school here in, in Pennsylvania. Again, showing you that this kind of main system is still very much the way that, that it's taught. Um, I, I have some frustrations with that, as you'll see uh, here in just a little bit, uh, but it's still a dominant way to teach it. And again, I'm sure that many of you have taught it that way too. I confess when I taught world history, 
to undergraduates. Uh, I taught it this way too, because this was the only way to explain a, an event as complicated as the First World War in as little time as I had. So the line that I've been using with people is that there's a kind of 15 minute way of explaining the First World War, you're looking at it, and there is a full semester way to explain the outbreak of the First World War, but there really isn't much in between. Next slide, please, Lynn. Okay, so what I wanna do is kind of blow this up and, and kind of um, um, show you why I think that this won't work. So the first of the end, the first of the main is, is the M, it's militarism. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken in a little town in Alsace, it was then German. Uh, the town is called Zabern in German, Z-A-B-E-R-N, Zabern in French. Uh, it's a British, or sorry, it's a German army garrison town in 1913. And you can see the German officer who's in the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, is a 19-year-old lieutenant who causes a stir when he hears that there's going to be uh, a strike. He hears that there's going to be uh, industrial unrest here in the little town of Severn, and he tells his troops that if that happens, he'll pay them for every French, uh, every Alsatian socialist that they shoot in the disturbances. Uh, then when this begins to grow up into a bigger scandal, he decides to do what you see here. This is him walking with an armed guard of seven German soldiers simply to buy a loaf of bread. What this turns into is something that becomes known in European history as the Zabern Affair or the Severn Affair, depending on which country that you're in. I don't want to get into it too, too deeply. The point I really want to make about it is that this happens in Germany. The German army decides to say that it can do whatever it wants to because it's under siege and it invokes an old Napoleonic era siege law. The, the details of this are less important than what comes next. What comes next is a really powerful response from the German people to say that this is a real overstep of military authority, that the German army has done something wrong. It creates this massive scandal in Germany, uh, similar to the Dreyfus Affair in France, for those of you who are familiar with it. The outcrop of this is that it's the first time, the only time in the history of the German Second Reich when the parliament votes no confidence in the government. It's also the only time in the history of the Second Reich that the parliament did not rise when the Kaiser came into the Reichstag building. And this is all happening just before the outbreak of the First World War. This is happening over the winter of 1913 to 1914. What the German government decided to do was to take the entire garrison, take every soldier out of the town of Severn, but not punish any individual person for the things that they had done. It's a compromise. It doesn't really make anybody happy, but it ends the problem. The message it sends to the rest of Europe is that European governments, first the Dreyfus Affair in France, now the Severn Affair, Affair in Germany, have sent the message to their own militaries that there's a line they cannot cross. And what you see here is a statement from a French socialist newspaper just a month before the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, talking about the ways in which militarism has receded, talking about the ways in which Europe feels to be a safer place than it had been in previous years. And it had been during crises in 1911, and in 1905. So I think it's really difficult to make the case that militarism is higher in Europe in the summer of 1914 than it had been in previous years. In fact, the opposite is happening. And one th reason I think this is so very important is that this is a reason why the First World War hits the European people as such an intellectual shock, such, a, such an emotional shock. Had this war begun in 1905, where there was a crisis in Morocco, had this war begun over a second crisis in Morocco in 1911, maybe it wouldn't have surprised the European people in quite the same way. But it happens in the summer of 1914 when the European people think that things are getting better, not worse. Next slide, please. We know from the Cold War, we know from other periods in history that alliances in and of themselves do not create wars. Uh, in fact, what these alliance systems are de designed to do is to prevent a state from overreaching. And as, as it's going to happen, that won't happen here in 1914. These alliances are built to balance each other out. The idea, of course, is that one state can't act too crazy uh, because the other states are acting to balance it, both the enemy states and their own allies. And what I mean by that is that all alliance systems are written defensively which is to say if state A attacks state B, state C will come to its rescue. What that means for the, the, the allied system, France, Russia, and England especially, is that if France decides to start a war over Alsace-Lorraine, or if Germany decides to start a war, the other states in its alliance system are not obligated to come to its defense. So this system is understood by the peoples of Europe to be a defensive, stabilizing system. Now we know once the war breaks out that it's gonna cause many of these states 
to kick in, to, to enter into their alliance obligations. But it's really difficult, it seems to me, to argue that the alliance system is itself a cause of the war. Next slide, please, Lynn. Imperialism, oh, sorry, this is Stefan Zweig, the, the Viennese intellectual, talking about uh, the importance of the diplomats and looking at the ways in which diplomatic uh, systems act to stop crises. And this is Stefan Zweig talking about the July crisis of 1914. So right now, next slide, please. Okay, this is a map of uh, Africa as it was divided in the late 19th century by the European great powers. The point is not to say that Europeans were not acting in an imperial fashion. Of course they were. They divided Africa this way specifically because they wanted to remove imperialism as a cause of conflict between them. So by dividing Europe up in the way that they divided it up, what they did was remove Africa, remove the empires, as a cause for international conflict. The same thing is true of the agreement that Britain and Russia come to in 1905, which resolves all imperial events uh, between them. The arrow that I have uh, the slide pointing to here uh, points to a little place off the west coast of Morocco in 1911, where something happens called the Panther Incident, where the Germans are supposed to have sent a gunboat to support their imperial rights in Morocco, which is a complicated uh, legal issue. The reason I put that slide in there, as you can quite see, that is the boat that the Germans sent. And what you can see there is that that boat doesn't have any guns on it at all. And that's the point. By sending an unarmed ship, Germany was making its point without risking escalation in a place that wasn't important to Germany. So again, really difficult for me to understand the ways in which one could argue that imperialism is causing any of this. Once the war begins, of course, it means that the empires are involved. But in terms of causes, it seems to me imperialism makes no sense. And if we could have the next, this is the what I love, Lord Salisbury, a former British prime minister, who talked about imperialism this way. We have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's foot has ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly where the mountains and rivers and lakes were. The point, of course, is that one doesn't go to war over places that one can't find on a map. And in my view, in 1914, it's illogical to argue that imperialism is a cause of this war. Once the war begins, of course, the war will go from being a European one to a world one because of imperialism. But that's a different statement. Finally, nationalism. Um, I'm not arguing, I am not arguing in the book or in this talk that nationalism was unimportant to Europeans. What I am arguing is that nationalism is neither a sufficient nor a necessary cause for war in 1914. What I mean by that is that Europeans may have felt themselves proud to be French or German or Italian, but they didn't feel the need to kill anybody over that. Uh, and the issue that is often cited is the issue of Alsace-Lorraine. You will sometimes see in textbooks, you'll often sometimes see in popular media explanations of the outbreak of the war, that France went to war for Alsace-Lorraine. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and here are just a couple of quotations to kind of indicate that. Uh, one comes from a French magazine called the Mercure de France, which did a big survey of French youth in 1912, uh, a kind of problem that you see crop up periodically in history where uh, older people, people my age, middle-aged people, uh, don't really think they understand young people. So they say, well, let's find out what's motivating them. Some of the questions in the Mercure de France um, uh, study, the, the, the questionnaire, involve questions about foreign policy. And you can see this young man uh, was cited by the Mercure de France as being typical of people of his generation. And this speaking specifically about Alsace-Lorraine. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here again is not that nationalism doesn't exist. It is that people in Europe are not driven by nationalism to start this war. There was no reason, national reason, in order to start this war. Next slide, please. I can talk more about that in the Q&A if anybody's interested. We have also tried to uh, explain this war by blaming one side or the other. Uh, very famously in the 1960s came the book on the left, Fritz Fischer's Germany's Aims in the First World War. Uh, the actual German translation is something more like Germany's bid for world power, in which Fischer overturned really 50 years of German thinking on the First World War and argued that in fact, Germany did start the First World War with an attempt to try to go for what they called Weltkrieg, for, for world war and world power. Um, and Fischer argued that Germany's behavior in the First and Second World Wars 
bore tremendous similarity to one another. Uh, it became a, a, a very unexpected bestseller in Germany in the 1960s. It changed the way that Europeans thought about the First World War. It was translated into English, and even 55 or plus years down the road, uh, we historians still refer to the Fritz Fischer thesis when we talk about uh, the origins of the First World War. Those people who blame Germany subscribe to the Fischer thesis, those who don't run against the Fischer thesis. More recently, Sean McMeekin, an American historian, has written this book, The Russian Origins of the First World War, in which he blames Russia uh, in an argument that I think is very creative and very interesting, uh, not fully compelling, but very creative and very interesting. Uh, even more recently than that, Jeffrey Warrow, a good friend of mine at the University of North Texas, uh, wrote a book in which he blamed Austria-Hungary, Austria and then the book on the right, which caused quite a stir in Great Britain, maybe 20, 25 years ago, Neil Ferguson, the Scottish historian uh, who wrote a book called The Pity of War, in which he completely unconvincingly, as far as I'm concerned, uh, blamed Great Britain. Uh, no book that I'm aware of blames France, um, which is important, and I can talk about that. If any state can say that it's fighting a war for the most just reason of all, which is national defense, it is France. So we have two sets of explanations. We can use the structural explanation, where we can argue that the kind of militarism, alliance, imperialism, nationalism, that all of that stuff is playing in to create a situation where war was almost inevitable, just waiting for some spark like, like the Archdukes, we can all, like Archduke's assassination. We can also take these diplomatic explanations, or for lack of a better term, the blame literature, and find one state, one small group of people uh, that we can blame. In my mind, Dr. Nyberg, it sounds like we may have lost your sound. Give us just a second, guys. We'll go ahead and get that back. Ah, the beauties of live webinar. Let's see here. For those of you who are uh, listening, give us just a second to try to get Dr. Nyberg's audio back. Please feel free, throw some questions in. I have some wonderful questions in the queue here, and we're going to ask as many as we can at the end. Dr. Nebra, give me one more shot at trying to say hello. If not, I'm going to jump to my section. We're going to come back to you. And hopefully we can get it fixed. You can interrupt when we, if we can get it fixed. If you're really having trouble, I'm going to have you pop out and pop back in because sometimes that's going to do the trick. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is kind of jump ahead um, and go ahead and talk a little bit about how we would go ahead and teach this. And hopefully we'll get Dr. Nyberg back and be able to kind of jump ahead through here. So what my specialty is, is I like to look at the history and then I like to kind of go digging through and trying to figure out how you can actually use this in a classroom. We've got a couple great questions about how to use this in a classroom. I promise we're going to get to as many of those in the Q&A as possible. But what I found myself is I was doing the readings and I like to print out the readings and scribble all over them. I do kill some trees in the name of history. I found myself kept drawing little conversation bubbles because the more I read about this and the more I read Dr. Nyberg's book ex excerpts and the primary documents, I start to think about these people talking. And what I'd like to do is kind of give an example of how I might be able to take this into a classroom. Now, what I'm trying to do, what's my rationale here? What are the skills I'm trying to develop? Because let's be honest, we're socialized teachers, we are skill-based teachers. What am I looking to do? First off, if I'm gonna use these kind of primary documents, I'm looking to build historical comprehension. I'm looking to really drive home the idea of perspective and point of view. And at the end of the day, I wanna drive home historical analysis. I don't just wanna understand what happened, but I want to understand why it happened. So how is it that I'm going to do that? First, and this is a really, really big point. In order for our students to really work with these primary documents and understand them, 
they need to help understand the context. Because if you just start dropping primary documents in the classroom, students don't have that. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to use the question box here and turn the question out to you for a moment. I'd like to know some strategies that you use in your classroom to set context before diving into primary documents with your students. So go ahead, write to the question box. Tell me some ways that you go ahead and help to set context. While everybody's answering, Dr. Nyberg, I can see you. Can we hear you? All right, I can see you. We're still having some audio issues. My suggestion, Dr. Nyberg, exit out of the whole thing and come on back. Hopefully that'll fix it. All right, let's see, some things that we've got for context. Uh, we've got read aloud, short videos and songs. I'd love to hear how you're using songs. Go ahead and put that in there. Videos, uh, documentaries, let's see here. Uh, background information, how do you do that? I do that with video. Uh, reading, uh, please don't Are call reading boring. Oh, yes, well, now we can hear you. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. I think I might have lost uh, Wi-Fi there for a minute. That's okay. Can let's finish this question and then we'll go ahead and jump back to you. Okay. All right, let's see. What else are we getting students to do to set context? Got to have lots of answers. We've talked about some teachers are using flipped classrooms with videos, uh, starting conversation and using thinking maps, activating prior knowledge. That's really, really key. Students have to know what's going on in the world because that's what helps them understand what's being written or spoken or drawn at any given time. Uh, let's see here. We've got KWL. That's always, it's very simple, but it works really well. What do you know? What do you want to know? Uh, let's see here. Independent or group, group inquiry. Analyze a photograph from the time. Um, images, lectures. Oh, somebody admitted to lecturing. If you call it direct instruction, it's not a lecture. Just saying. Uh, let's see here, flipping them situation into more common social or family situations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, using podcasts to start interest. Okay, these are all really good things. Sorry, we're kind of going a little out of order here. What I'm going to do is actually flip it back. I'm going to give the floor back to Dr. Nyberg. We're going to see if we can let him finish up, and then we'll come back and talk about what we do once we set the context to get students going. So, Dr. Nyberg, go ahead. Hi, my, my apologies. Somehow I lost. Uh, can you go back a few slides, please? Yes. Yeah, let's go there. Okay, so uh, my apologies. We lost uh, lost internet connection there for some reason at our house. So I don't know where we dropped, but um, what I want to do, uh, move forward, please. Move forward, please, Lynn. There you go. Okay, so um, I don't know where I dropped off, but the, the two sets of explanations are that main structural explanation and then what we sometimes call in, the, in my field the historiographic blame game, trying to figure out which state uh, is most responsible. At least this one, this this last one, this domestic explanations one, really is a focus on a very small number of diplomats, statesmen, um, you know, decision makers in each of these countries, which I think complicates the question quite a bit. So what I want to do is explain a little bit of what that context that I heard Lynn talking about in 1914 was like, and what I think really happened, and why I think it's important to teach it to students in this way. So next slide, please, Lynn. My 15-year-old daughter has fixed my internet problem, so this shouldn't happen again. <laughs> okay, so what we know about the assassination of the Archduke, what we what we think we know, what we sometimes teach, is that because of that main that we talked about earlier, Europe is a kind of tinderbox just waiting for something bad to happen. And the bad thing that is supposed to have happened is the death of these two people, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, the Archduchess Sophie. Uh, now, they are assassinated in June of 1914. It is instructive to me, important to me, that we call this summer of 1914 the July crisis. We don't call it the June crisis. And there's a very good reason for that. And the reason is that once these two are assassinated, it makes European news for about a day or two, and then it disappears. It's on the back pages very quickly, and within a couple of days, nobody's really talking about it. And again, to Stefan Zweig, 
um, living in Vienna at the time, who wrote only a few weeks more and the name and figure of Franz Ferdinand would have disappeared for all time out of history. And I think he's right. Uh, there had been other nobles, other important heads of state, heads of government assassinated in Europe before. They didn't produce a war. There was absolutely no reason why this one should have. Uh, next slide, please, or next. So you'll see another quotation here from the Irish Times which is saying, look, it's just another tale of blood in the annals of the ill-fated House of Habsburg. And you can do what I did, which is to go back to people's letters and memoirs and diaries, and you can see their reactions, which are, well, okay, we don't, we're not really sure who this guy is. We're not really sure where Sarajevo is. Um, he's dead, oh well. You know, if you're living in France, if you're living in England, if you're living in Germany, there's really no reason why you would think that this assassination has anything to do with you or that it could create an international crisis. Next slide, please. This is why most Europeans are not worried. Most diplomatic crises that had gone on in Europe, I mentioned two of them, the one in 1905 and the one in 1911. Uh, there's also one that comes before it. It's called the Fashoda crisis. It happens in Africa. Uh, and there's the Balkan Wars that happened from October 1912 to July 1913. What Europeans are expecting are long drawn out crises that magically somehow get resolved in the end. And the analogy that I've drawn is somewhat to the way the United States' relationship with North Korea has been lately, with periods of real tension where people worry, and then periods of calm, and then somehow something gets decided in the end, and it doesn't really require you as a citizen to do very much. So what I want you to note about these four important crises here is the length of time that they all go, the amount of time that they go, they go for months, and to note that they all end perfectly peacefully with no war between the peoples of Europe. And the last one especially occurs in the Balkans, where the war, effect, of course, affects people living in the Balkans, but it does not become, the, the phrase in this time period would have been a general war. It remains contained to the Balkans. So what you see, and I've, I've got a couple of these quotations on here. Uh, one is a British newspaper, one is a French newspaper. I could have picked Germany, I could have picked Austria, I could have picked almost any of them. How late in the game they still have confidence that the diplomats are going to solve this thing again. Uh, by July 29th, at the very least, in the, at the bottom, the major decisions for war have already been made, although there's no reason why the people of Europe would have known that. They didn't know that. But I want you to note how much faith the European people had uh, and how late they had it. So one reason why this war hits quite so quickly is that the, the, the cause, uh, the Archduke assassination, nobody really thinks will lead to war. And then at the bottom, you know, this kind of faith that they still have in the diplomats of Europe. Next slide, please, Lynn. Okay, so what was different? What, what happened in 1914 that was so different? And this is where I think the lessons of 1914 begin to get um, a little bit difficult to explain, but they also become really important. What happens is that the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand didn't really bother that many people in Austria-Hungary. He was an unpopular person for personal reasons. He was an unpopular person for political reasons, which I can get into in the Q&A if anybody is interested. What it represents, however, if you're Austria, is that this assassination is what we would today call an act of state-sponsored terrorism. If the Serbian government was truly behind the assassination, and I should note that 104 years after it happened, we still don't have an entirely clear answer to that question. But if you could convince the people of Europe that Serbia was behind it, then Austria would have the right to demand something of Serbia, whether that was money or territory or changes to their legal structure, Austria would have the right to demand something. What that means for people in Austria is that they think they're going to have an advantage in the system. They're going to have a chance to take action against Serbia and that the international community will have no choice but to stand to, to the side. So if you're Austrian, this presents to you a series of circumstances that are better than anything you possibly could have imagined. Uh, Austria is uh, what some people have described Austria as being on the wrong side of history, meaning that it is a multinational empire. There are people in Austria who are worried about how much longer this system can stay together. Uh, the Emperor of Austria had been on the throne since 1848. Uh, he's really old. Uh, he did die in 1916. And a lot of people think that the, there's no way that the Austro-Hungarian Empire could possibly survive his death. But if you're Austria, this is a perfect opportunity to take a gamble. This is a, a very unusual kind of confluence of circumstances, perfect storm, if you will, of looking like a victim in the international community 
And the fact that this crisis in Sarajevo doesn't really affect anybody else in Europe. So the man at the top of this slide, Konrad von Hutzendorf, the commander of the Austrian army, uh, is making the argument to the government in Vienna and the government in Budapest that if we move quickly against Serbia, nobody will stand up for the Serbs and we'll have an opportunity to do something, to enforce something before the international community can respond. And the one country that had typically been on Serbia's side, Russia, is also the one country that will be the least likely to stand up for a country that kills royals. Because the entire Russian system, of course, is based on the principle of supreme rule, the czar, all of that stuff. And in all of those assumptions, Austria is not wrong about any of those assumptions. Now, what they do is go to the Germans and say, well, look, if a crisis does happen, what would you do? In effect, does the assassination of one of our royals count as us acting defensively if we respond to it? And the German government, the German army, led here by the man at the bottom, uh, Helmut von Moltke the Younger, his Helmut von Moltke the Elder was his uncle, um, they make the, the exact same calculation that the stars are lining up for us in a way that we could never expect them to do under any other circumstances. France and Britain, because this doesn't affect them in the least, or Italy, are very likely to stand aside and not take any action at all. Russia is likely not to stand up for people who kill kings. And if you're Germany, this is a chance for Austria, which is your ally, but you don't have a lot of faith in them. This is a, a, a chance for an international crisis where Austria would actually do something, would actually be willing to fight very hard. So the gamble that Germany makes is that they will let Austria go ahead and do whatever it's going to do to Serbia, presuming that one of two things will happen. The most likely scenario, they think, is that Russia will back down and let Austria attack Serbia. If that happens, Austria gains, Germany gains by association, and Germany doesn't have to do anything. If, on the other hand, Russia does respond, which they think is pretty unlikely, then Germany can act telling its people that we're doing this for defensive reasons. So the point here is twofold. One, it is an incredibly unusual set of circumstances that the great powers get. And as you all know, hopefully sitting there listening to this, what happens is that the crisis that they get is not the crisis that they planned for. So that when the war begins, Germany's army actually moves west towards Belgium and France. That's because the military plans and the diplomatic plans are not in sync. So two things are going on. One is that the crisis they get is not the crisis that they plan for. And the second thing that's going on, as I'll show you here in a bit, is that the whole situation becomes very chaotic very quickly, much faster than anybody could have predicted. Next slide, please. So this is what Austria did. On July 23rd, Austria delivered an ultimatum to Serbia. That ultimatum said that in order for Serbia to avoid war, it had to do a series of things including allow Austro-Hungarian police to come into Serbia and conduct the investigation. If Serbia did not respond within 48 hours, fully accepting everything in the Austrian ultimatum, Austria would consider that war had broken out. Now, two things are really important about this. One is that, remember that slide that I showed you earlier, instead of giving the system months and months and months to work itself through, Austria had shortened the timeline to just 48 hours. That scares a lot of people. This is the moment when Europeans start to really get worried. These are the moments when officers in their in military start coming home from vacations. Many senior officers were in fact on vacation in states they were soon to be fighting, which gives you an indication how much of a surprise all this was. This is also when statesmen, diplomats, prime ministers start to get really worried too. This is when the crisis really breaks. It's why we call it the July crisis. And as you can see, on July 26, Serbia responded, accepting every condition in the ultimatum except one. The next day, Russia, France, Italy, and Germany all accepted what they called arbitration in principle. Arbitration means that you'll find a neutral country, a country not involved in this. It could have been Great Britain, because Britain has nothing involved in this crisis at all. It could have been the United States, which had acted as the arbiter in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905 and all the states agree to abide by what that arbiter says, and the arbiter pledges that it will get no advantage from whatever it has decided. So it's kind of like the way I've described it. It's almost like a judge duty of international relations. It's a, it's a core principle of international relations before World War I. 
On July 28th, the International Socialists meet in Brussels. Uh, what's interesting to me about this meeting is that socialists are coming from all over Europe. They are talking about a wide variety of things. They had talked about defense and military issues in the past. On July 28th, they make the decision that there's no reason to worry about a war breaking out in Europe, that, that all the talk from the Balkans is just talk. Uh, if there's still a problem, they'll meet in September and they'll make a decision about what to do then. So again, this notion of how much of a shock that this is going to be, that this actually goes to war, because on that same day, of course, Austria declared war on Serbia, Germany rejected arbitration the next day, and Russia mobilized its army on July 30th. So again, this very quick timeline, I would argue the timeline is actually less than the week from July 23rd to July 30th, and you can see that from the observations of Edith Wharton, the American writer who was in Paris as all this was happening, and this was her response. Of course there couldn't be war. The cabinets like naughty children were dangling their feet over the edge. But something would happen, she thought, and most Europeans thought, something would happen that would get us out of this. Next slide, please. And again, I did this on purpose. I took two statements from the exact same day. Uh, one is from Germany and one is from France, making almost exactly the same argument that each country could make the case it, with the possible exception of Austria, but I think even Austria, every country in Europe can make the case that what it is doing is defensive. What it is doing is protecting itself and protecting its own interests, that it didn't have anything to do with the outbreak of the war. So historians of World War I talk about what they call a dual consent for war, that, that is the consent of the European people to go to war and the consent of the European people to continue fighting. And much of that dual consent is based upon the belief in every European country, possibly with the exception of Austria, that they went to war for a just reason. They went to war for defensive reasons. And I think what you see is the, country who's, the countries whose 1914 beliefs in defensive war go away, these are the countries that have revolutions within a couple of years, or the countries that disintegrate. So Germany responds to this crisis not by going to war against Russia, which is where the threat is, but by invading neutral Belgium and invading a France that posed no threat to it whatsoever. And that creates a problem for the logic of the German empire. But as you can see here, as late as July 30th, people like the Berlin Tageblatt, a newspaper, are arguing that they believe that what they're doing is defensive in nature. Next slide, please. Again, the same kind of notion here of war of self-defense. Again, I've given you two. One is French and one is German, making almost exactly the same argument that we didn't want this war, but if someone's going to force it upon us, we'll go ahead and fight it. And the one on the right is especially significant. It comes from a really radical left-wing French newspaper called Le Bonnet Rouge, uh, which had been very anti-government, anti-imperial, anti-almost everything in France. And then it says, however, that if another country is going to come and fight this war, we will all know how to do our duty. And almost every member of the syndicalists, which is the group the Bonnet Rouge represents, almost every single one of them volunteered for the French army. So again, this sense of the war as being defensive is critical to this dual mobilization that historians talk about. Next slide, please. This is Jean Charest. He is one of the most important, most famous of the French socialists. And I just want to tell a, a very quick story about him. Uh, Jaurès came back from Paris after that meeting in, or uh, after the meeting in Brussels, he came to Paris, convinced that the French government must have done something monstrously stupid uh, to bring this war to, to the situation that it's in. He went and confronted the president of France, a man by the name of Raymond Poincaré. Uh, the two men, Poincaré and Jaurès, hated each other. Poincaré opened up all of the diplomatic message traffic, showed it all to Jean Jaurès, and said, tell me what I should have done differently. Tell me what you would have done differently. Jaurès left that meeting convinced that France did not want a war and that France was fighting defensively. He went to a restaurant across the street. That's the picture on the right, right there. He told his colleagues in the French Socialist Party uh, that France had, in fact, done everything it could to avoid a war, that Poincaré was not to blame, that France had no choice but to fight not only for France's safety, but for the safety of all of Europe. Uh, shortly after that meeting, a young man by the name of Raoul Villain stuck a pistol into the window of the cafe uh, and shot Jean Jaurès dead, uh, an assassination that shocked Europe far more uh, than did the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Historians have looked back on this moment as saying, well, this was maybe the last moment that Europe wasn't going to go to war, but I think that's the wrong interpretation. The message is that even Jean Jaurès understood the importance of France fighting this war in the summer of 1914. Next slide, please.
Okay, I love this quotation and I love this um, episode here and I want to explain it to you. This is uh, the cemetery in Ypres, which is uh, in Belgium. At the end of the war, the German army asked Katie Kollwitz, the, the famous German artist, to design a piece of art for that cemetery. And this is what she came back with. She came back with uh, two figures of mourning parents mourning over the grave of their own son. And in this case, for Katie Kolwitz, it, it was a real emotion, her son Peter being killed in October of 1914. This is a letter that she wrote. Next image, please. This is a letter that she wrote, I think, to her sister right about this same time period, in which she wrote, one cannot hold on to any illusions anymore. Nothing is real but the frightfulness of this state, which we almost grow used to. In such times, it seems so stupid that the boys must go to war, the whole thing is so ghastly and insane. Occasionally comes the foolish thought, how can they possibly take part in such madness? But they must, they must. And then again, just a couple of weeks later, she lost her own son, Peter. What's important to me about that letter, what is so powerful about that letter, is her realization of two things. One, that the war was stupid and ought never, ought never to have been fought. But the second realization that once begun, Germany really had no choice but to win it. That the only thing worse than fighting this war would be to actually lose this war. So that I think what happens here, and it's it's in place as early as September 1914, states are not fighting for a positive outcome. That is, they're not fighting because of something they want to get. They are now fighting to hold off the cost of defeat. And military theorists talk about this as sunk costs of war. The more you invest in a conflict, the harder it is to stop it short of victory. What that does, I think, is set as early as 1914, the conditions for a total war. Because this isn't a war over a coal field or, you know, by the, by, even by this point, September 30th, 1914, nobody any longer cares who shot the Archduke or who's being punished for it. You're now in a situation of total war. Next slide, please. Okay, why does this matter? And we'll wrap up and then I'll be happy to take any questions uh, um, that you might have. I put this quotation on the right without identifying what country the person, the soldier in this case comes from. And the reason I didn't tell you what country he comes from is because I don't think it actually matters. Uh, what he wrote was 1914 was a year of pain and sorrow, not only for us, but for the whole of what is called the civilized world. This terrible war goes on and on. And whereas you thought at the start that it would be over in a few weeks, there is now no end in sight. Your feelings harden, you become increasingly indifferent. You don't think about the next day anymore. A wish for all of us for 1915, May this new year make up for 1914 and bring us peace. Now, what I knew as an historian when I was going through this document and when I was working with this is that 1915 would not bring Europe peace. 1925 really wouldn't do it. 1935 really wouldn't do it. 45 certainly didn't do it. 55, 65, 75, 85 were all part of the Cold War, which is itself a product of the First World War. So to me, the idea of coming back to 1914 is absolutely critical to understand the ways in which the old European system was broken. And in my view, from 1914 until really about 1989, Europe is looking for what kind of a system is going to replace the world that was broken in 1914. So three conclusions here that I want to end with, and then I'll be happy to take whatever questions. And I apologize again for the mix up with the internet, but Fortunately, I have a really smart 10th grader who could fix the problem for me. One, I think we have to get rid of this idea of the European people just want just so bloodthirsty with nationalism and imperialism and alliances and militarism that all they wanted to do was go and kill their neighbors. All they were waiting for was this kind of spark that the assassination represented. It's not true. Uh, there's almost no evidence to suggest that it is true. Uh, it would be nice, I think, if it were true, because we could then make the argument that since Europeans no longer feel this way, the risk of war has gone away. Uh, a Yale historian by the name of Timothy Snyder calls this the fable of the wise nation, this notion in Europe that the Europeans have learned the lessons of the two world wars. So they built the European Union, they've gotten to establish these very close friendships between France and Germany, for example, and other states in Europe. And therefore, war is not something that Europeans have to worry about anymore. Um, I have to be honest, I don't worry about France and Germany at all, but I don't think we can any longer argue that we can count on conflict being absent from Europe. Uh, France and Germany may have solved the problem, but there are others. Second, I think a reason why this war goes on so long, the reason why that this war becomes the total war that it becomes, is that it is quite easy for every country on the board to make the argument that the war they're fighting is defensive and therefore moral. Again, what I think happens is that over time, it becomes harder 
for Austria, Germany, and Russia to sustain that argument, it becomes not so hard for Britain and France to sustain it. So France wavers for a while in 1917, but fundamentally they don't break. The German army will break in 1918. The Austro-Hungarian Empire comes completely apart in 1918. And as of course, all of you know, Russia has that massive revolution in 1917. Finally, what I think happens and why I think World War I is so important to study and why you can't stop studying it in 1918, World War I was the cause not the effect of these nationalist hatreds. In other words, the events of 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 19, 19 even into 1919, are sufficient to create enough hatred to fuel the First World War, the Second World War, a Holocaust, and I would argue a Cold War. And I'm entirely sympathetic with the argument of some of my colleagues who study the Middle East that we are still figuring out what will replace the 1914 order in the Middle East. That is what replaces the Ottoman Empire in that part of the world, uh, which is itself very deeply shaped and formed uh, by the First World War. So with that, let me stop and take your questions and apologize once again uh, for the internet issues. All right. I, honestly, I've got two really good pages of questions. I'm going to get to a couple now and then I'll hold some till the end. Um, I'm excited about this lecture because it really challenges a lot of us teachers because, you know, we all kind of have that main organizer somewhere in our stash. Um, and you know, one of the questions that was asked, and again, I'm kind of blending a couple here, is if you're looking at only being able to teach World War II in a short time period, a week, maybe World two, or sorry, World War One, <laughs> would you use Maine or something like it, or would you abandon it completely? When you only have a short time, what would you focus on with students? So me personally, I would probably abandon it. Um, and the longer I'm teaching this stuff, the less I think the military dimensions of it really need to be taught to high school students. Uh, even here where I teach, my students are mostly army colonels and lieutenant colonels. Um, I don't think we need to teach too much of the military stuff because I don't think there's any scenario in which the United States Army is gonna fight the way that they fought in those years. So if it were me, I think I would probably um, reduce importance on the, the, the battles, reduce importance on the campaigns, reduce importance on the generals, um, and start looking at why the states, including the US, why, we, why the states get involved in the war, and how the peace process is shaped at the end. I would probably look at home fronts. I would wanna look at um, things like the Great Migration in the US case. I'd wanna look at the way that uh, revolutions come out of this war in places like Ireland and the Middle East. Um, I probably would try as much as I could to focus on that. But I, I think the main uh, method for teaching it is, is actually not just wrong. I think it's actually misleading. And I think it contributes to a view of the First World War as something that's really not really worth deep and intensive study. Okay, so now we've turned their two week units into six week units, but <laughs> 50 here's, week a, units. here's kind of two other ways to look at it, different questions. Uh, one question is, do you think it's fair to think of Maine less as causes of the war and more of symptoms of the emerging conflict? Um, so I don't think militarism has anything, really has very much to do with it at all. I think you could actually, depending on how one wants to define militarism, I think you could really make the case that we are in a more militarized age than they were. So France had um, a serious debate going on in the pre-war period about whether conscription ought to be for two years or three years. Uh, Germany had the Severn affair. You know, there, there are these issues that are going through Europe. I think it's actually misleading to depict Europe as a militarized place. There were militarists in Europe, to be sure, in every country, uh, but in no place do they dominate the discourse. Um, I don't think alliances makes any sense either because those alliances had been in place for a long time. Imperialism makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, and nationalism is really complicated too. So uh, the only one of those that I think is probably a driver of the war or a symptom or, or uh, whichever word you used uh, is probably imperialism because once Great Britain comes into the war, that means Canada, South Africa, India, New Zealand, Australia, all of those states come into the war as well. Uh, and that, of course, makes it extraordinarily difficult for Germany to win a long war. Okay. Let me ask one other question. Um, do you think that socialists or other elites, they th did they think that the Congress of Vienna would endure? Is that maybe why they thought this was going to be resolved and the diplomats were going to handle it? No. What they really think is that there's no existential, there's no real reason for European states to go to war. They, 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 again, a reason why I think this is so well worth studying is they make a very similar argument to the one 
that I hear being made a lot with the United States and China, that the more economies are intertwined, the more incentive states have to cooperate rather than to go to conflict. That's what they, that's a, a dominant um, way of thinking in the pre-World War I period. Uh, a, a, a man by the name of Norman Angel uh, wrote a very famous book. It was a bestseller in the years before World War I in which he made that exact argument that states would not go to war because there was nothing you could gain from war that would be worth the price of fighting. The other thing that is that is really dominant, 19, 1897 and 1905, or 1907, are the Hague Conventions that are signed by every state in Europe, and they're really pushing for arbitration. Um, the, the place where I worked, the U.S. Army War College, was founded by an American named Elihu Root, who was Secretary of State and Secretary of War. He won the, a Nobel Prize for his ideas on binding arbitration, meaning that states would have to come together and work things out rather than go to war. Those are the kinds of things that Europeans are putting a lot of faith in. Um, and again, the First World War just blows those ideas up. Okay, let me ask one more question before I shift back to the pedagogy here. I have so many good ones here. This is actually hard to choose. One question, if you're teaching this with middle schoolers and you've really got to boil it down, what's the one or two ideas you would really drive home to our middle school student audience? Maya, you're a middle school student. What's the most important thing you learned about World War One? Okay, my daughter just said I didn't learn anything about World War One, so there you go. Um, I think the two things I would want to stress to them are the global nature of this. So in a world that is intensely linked and intensely globalized, uh, which is the case in 1914, I would make the argument that the world of 1914 is in some ways more global than the world we live in today. In 1914, you could trade goods and people could move from place to place without, I mean, you could come to the United States more or less without a passport from most countries. Um, you could do this with very little paperwork, very little government tracking what you were doing. Uh, the First World War blew that system up. So the first thing I would want to do is stress the, the complexity of globalization, if that's a theme that your, your class is working on. Um, and I think, you know, my daughter didn't, didn't take this approach in her classes, but I, I like taking a couple of individuals. You can do this in your own home community. Hopefully you have local resources and look at the ways that the war is changing who they are. Um, you know, you can focus on Gandhi as a great example, a man who is a, a lawyer, Indian lawyer in South Africa who was in support of the First World War, supported Great Britain going to war. Uh, by the end of the war, he's fully committed to kicking Britain out of, out of India. You can make the same argument with Ho Chi Minh, who is living in Vietnam, who initially supported the, 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 the French war and then became adamant that Vietnam had no choice but to break away. You can do this with Vera Britton, who's um, ready to go off to Oxford. In 1914, she wrote a book called Testament of Youth. Uh, by the time the war is over, her fiance, brother, and best friend are all dead, and she's become a committed pacifist. Um, I could give other examples, but you could easily find some of your own and look at the ways that a war changes the way that people think about themselves, their communities, who they are. You can do this with the Great Migration, as the number of African Americans who moved from South to North during the First World War. Um, you can do this with the feminist movement and the connection to women's suffrage, which comes right after World War I. Uh, the ways in which the, uh, an outside factor, a war that begins in Europe uh, and then goes global, the way that that impacts the way that people live their lives. I think that's a real neat way for students to, to connect to an individual, connect to history through people. Excellent. Lots of great ideas here. Let me jump in. I'm going to finish up the part of some teaching strategies for our teachers, and then we'll come back and do Q&A at the end, either on content or on pedagogy. So keep those questions coming. I've got two pages on my notebook here. All right, so we were talking about historical dialogue and getting students to think. We talked about setting context, because let's be honest, if they don't understand what's going on in the world and in these nations, trying to give them primary source documents of what the Kaiser or the president or the king is saying isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. It's just going to become an exercise in reading. So one of the ways that I've approached this with students that I would encourage you to think about is to think about the context in language that they understand by setting up the people. So I would set this up as players. Uh, one thing I do whenever possible, when you have a primary document that's written by a person, try to get an image or a picture, aside from the fact that the facial hair on Kaiser Wilhelm is absolutely spectacular and some of his contemporaries are even better. I think that helps students personalize and realize that the people writing this were real people. And no matter what time period of history we're looking at or what perspective we're looking at, people are people. 
So one of the things that I would do is work with students to help them understand what's the context of these players. So Kaiser Wilhelm, what's his position? And I put the one in bold that's like the non-negotiable, the don't mess up. You know, what's the German perspective? You know, they know that they cannot let Russia mobilize. And if Russia moves, they're going to have to move. They also know if they've got to fight, they've got to fight now. The longer they wait, the more others are going to be able to see what's going on. They also know that they have influence over Austria-Hungary. They kind of have the ability to control the game a little bit. And I think they also have a little bit of an inferiority complex. You know, Great Britain not really respecting them the way that they want. Now, how would I approach creating this context? It would depend on the age of students and the level of students I'm working with. So what I might do is I might start off by, with older students, I might have them create these bullet points. Where younger students, I might give them hints or maybe just give them this as their setup. So I did Germany as an example. What I'm going to do is take about a minute here, go into that question box. Let's go ahead and take the perspective of Tsar Nicholas II. What are his three or four bullet points, and again, in very simple student-friendly language, what would you say is the perspective of Russia? Go ahead. Right, they're starting to come in. All right, some key things I'm hearing. Support the Serbs, have their back. We've got to stand up or we're going to be in trouble. Or family, protect my alliances, be ready. Show strength, good. These are all kinds of things we want to talk about. Here's what I put down for that. If Austria declares war, game over, you got to play. You're a new nation. Remember, they had a big revolution not too long ago. You need to show strength. You know, they also think that Germany's trying to embarrass them, and they are not willing to give in and let Austria win. Some other ones, again, we're kind of tight on time, so I'll just throw a couple other ones out there for France. And seriously, look at that French mustache. Is that not the most French look ever? Uh, for Georges Clemenceau, if Germany invades France, you must fight. Germany has backed down before, stand up to the bully. Germany has also won before, you got to be careful, we're not having a repeat of that Franco-Prussian war, that didn't go so well. Um, Great Britain will help, they don't really like Germany either. King George V, keep a hold of that English Channel, we are not having a repeat of 1066 here, right? They get the to the English Channel, you got to fight back. British Navy's the best, keep it that way, that German Navy's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we don't really love France, but we don't want them to fall to Germany. And our Germany isn't in the greatest shape right now. Oops, that'll become a problem. Franz Joseph, uh, the best facial hair of all of them. You know, he made the ultimate, don't back down. Serbia is not accepting responsibility. Russia seems like they've got behind it. Germany's got your back. If Serbia goes, what's next? A domino effect, that's come up in a couple of your questions. And then, you know, President Wilson from the United States. This is a big mess in Europe. And let's be honest, in the summer of 14, your wife just died. Things are a little bit of mess in his head. The U.S. has those two big oceans that have isolated them. And an economic piece, that's come up in the question thread as well. We are trading partners. So helping students set the context. Once they've kind of got the context and know what the non-negotiables or the problems are, that's where I would go in and pull excerpts from those primary sources. How you pull and what you pull depends on the level for your students, but let them read it. Annotate words where you have to, pull out sections, paraphrase when needed. If you have to switch a word or two to help them or give that annotated bubble, do that, but let them read for themselves. Then here's what I would do. I would create a dialogue situation where I would enforce the students to integrate either quotes or ideas from the primary sources they read. So you can do that kind of traditionally in debate style. Uh, you can also, if you don't want to do it out loud or have quieter students, use the idea of a chalk talk debate. 
they debate and discuss, but you use butcher paper or whiteboards or anything that you can write on and have them argue back and forth, but in writing. Uh, you can do it electronically on discussion boards. Uh, you can do it on Twitter chats, lots of different ways, but get them using that content, whether they're paraphrasing or quoting. Remember, that's one of those skills we wanna drive home and teach them. And also help students see how this can help on their National History Day projects. These are the skills of paraphrasing, of quoting, of getting down to the nitty gritty of an idea, of showing different perspectives. I think this is a great setup for multiple characters in an NHD performance. I think it's a great setup to help them set their context section or page of their website. Um, and I think that it really helps paper writers think about what's being said and word choice. Okay. What I want to do, I know we are pushing up on time. I'm four minutes over. I'm sorry, our little technical problems delayed my hour just a little bit. I'm going to turn things back over to questions, but this is really, really important. Please, I know it's top of the hour. If you need to go, I need you to take a minute and complete the survey. So tinyurl.com slash WWICC feedback. Take a minute, fill that out. Give us your feedback tonight. What worked, what didn't what you'd like to see more of. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, we're gonna go back and ask some questions, but number one question, yes, I'm gonna share these materials with you. I'm gonna post it up all on Schoology tomorrow. Uh, all right, let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead and turn some cameras on here. I'll have Dr. Nyberg do the same, and we're gonna go ahead and take some more questions. I've got lots of content questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and toss a couple out to you. Um, Dr. Nyberg, a lot of people have questions about militarism. And they keep wanting to come back to this. And they're asking, for example, if it's not a short-term cause, is militarism a long-term cause that we need to consider? Because, you know, let's be honest, the more arms you have and the bigger army you have, the more likely you are to go to war. What would you say to that as a historian? Dr. Nyberg, you are muted. Can you please click your mute button so you can answer the question and we can hear you? Dr. Nyberg, can you hear me? Oh no. Sounds like we are losing. I can't hear you. We're having some trouble. There yeah, we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, we're hearing. We're having serious internet trouble here on this end. But again, fifteen-year-old expert is solving the problem. So, can I ask you this question about militarism? So, if it's not a short-term sure. cause, is it a long-term cause? Because you know, a couple questions say basically, you know, the more arms we have, the bigger standing armies we have, the more likely we are to go to war. What would you say to that as a historian? So it's not actually true. So the greatest military buildups in history occurred after World War II during the Cold War, yet the United States and Soviet Union never went to war. Um, and there's been another recent buildup since the end of the Cold War with China's massive military growth. So while it sounds like that's something that ought to make sense, in fact, it doesn't. Um, it does appear that it's possible, although it may not have happened in this situation, uh, for increased defense spending to actually counterbalance the two alliances against one another. So it, if you want to argue, I suppose you could, that in this case, um, once the balloon went up, so to speak, then you went from a small war to a large war because of militarism. I just don't see how you can say militarism is a causal factor getting you into the war in the first place. That one, I, I just, I don't see it. Okay. Well, we've got some other kind of contradictory questions kind of asking about the role of government. Mm -hmm. Do you think that these, uh, is it more about the militaristic side or is it more about the governments and the leaders of the governments and the decisions that they're making? What would you say to that? So I can't find any uh, head of state with the possible exception of Kaiser Wilhelm who argues during the July crisis that war is the best option we have. It's the one we want to go to. Only the Germans are making that case and only a small number of Germans are making that case. What I think is actually happening, thank you, we're using my daughter's phone as a hotspot, so we gotta plug it in. Um, so what, what, what I think is actually happening is that the speed of events is just completely overtaking them. Would you mind plugging that in? You're a very good kid, thank you. Yeah. 
you're a very good child. Um, what, what I think is actually happening in most cases is that states and governments are looking for ways to get out of this problem without going to war, uh, and they can't do it. What's also shocking to me is the um, lack of information that many of these heads of government and heads of state had about how their own militaries function. So the, my, my favorite example of this, my favorite case of this is the Kaiser himself, who when he finds out what's going on and finds out that, that, that all of this bluffs and brinksmanship and all of this will in fact lead to war, he turns to Helmut von Moltke, the younger, the nephew of the man that fought those wars that brought Germany together, and he says, okay, the crisis is in the East, go East, don't, don't invade France and Germany, don't invade France and Belgium. Um, and Helmut von Moltke says to him, your majesty, we can't do that. Like the war plan is to go East. And the Kaiser's response is to say, your uncle would have given me a better answer, which is remarkable. It's, it reveals that the Kaiser himself didn't really understand what was going on. So what we have today in the United States with the National Security Council, which is created in 1947, is designed to make sure a problem like that doesn't happen. But it's amazing to me. And what that tells me as an historian, if they thought a war was coming, they would have fixed that problem. The fact that they didn't indicates that it wasn't a high priority for them. So would you say that ultimately it was a failure of diplomacy or what would you say ultimately was that linchpin? I think, honestly, I think what happens is this, this weird perfect storm comes together. Um, if you want to lay the blame on Austria, you can blame Austria for setting a 48 hour deadline into the ultimatum, which means that it's very hard to find other ways out of this problem. What I really think happened is just a perfect storm just hit. The Germans had planned to go against France and the crisis is in the East, which nobody's expecting. Uh, the British don't really know what to do. Um, I didn't talk about this much in the presentation, but both Britain and France are completely absorbed by other things that are going on. Uh, Britain is absorbed by the problems in Ireland uh, and France is absorbed because the Minister of Finance's wife had just shot a newspaper editor dead um, in a fascinating case that, that went on inside France. Um, so there just isn't enough time. They're, they're busy looking at other things and there isn't enough time to control the crisis. That's really what I think happened. And then by the time you get to late August, early September of 1914, it doesn't really matter what the causes of the war were. You're now sunk in it. A couple teachers in the queue have asked questions about the role of technology or the role of industrialism and kind of the scramble for resources. What role, if any, do you think those factors had in the causes of World War One? So media is really interesting to me. I mean, you could do this. This is a time period where I think Paris had seven daily newspapers or, you know, London had something like 11. I mean, newspapers are incredibly important. And what you can actually track this. You can you can find days in late July when the morning newspapers will say, well, the war is coming, things look really terrible. And then the afternoon papers will say, oh no, they, they're, they're meeting, it's okay, everything's cool, everybody you know, kind of calm down. So I think you know, Twitter has certainly changed the way that our political discourse functions, uh, but something similar is happening 100 years ago. They're getting more information than they can process. And I think that's a part of the, the problem uh, because that information is contradictory, that information isn't always pointing in the same direction. Um, and that information is really confusing to people, just as I don't know how you all feel, but there are days I just I just have to get away from Twitter because it's too much contradictory information coming at me all at once. Um, the role of industrialization is is important. Um, but I still think, you know, dividing up Africa the way that they did and then integrating the European economies the way that it happened in, in the early part of the 20th century uh, makes that one also a little hard to argue for as a cause of the war. Um, I think it's certainly a cause of the way the peace comes out, which is to say that some states are created in bizarre ways because they have uh, an economic asset that the Europeans are, are competing over. Poland, that's certainly the case for uh, Czechoslovakia gets created the way that it gets created for that reason as well. Okay, here's an interesting question. How would you define total war? So, the way we think of it at the Army War College, it's a great question, that war is the interaction of ends, ways, and means. So ends is what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, means are the amount of resources you're willing to put in. Ways are the kind of tools, the methods that you're willing to use. We think of total war as a time period in which all three of those, ends, ways, and means, are moving out to the extremes. So in this case, the ends become the absolute destruction of your enemies. The means become a, 
the military and the war taking over a greater and greater and greater percentage of budgets and the ways become doing things that you wouldn't have done a couple of years earlier. So using poison gas, using submarines, blockading civilians, targeting civilians with artillery, the Armenian genocide, a perfect case study of this. Um, all three, the ends, ways, and means are all working out to their illogical extremes, if you will. Um, that's what we think of when we think of total war. Okay. Here's a nationalism question that came up. As you're talking about the different nations and their interactions, and we know that many of these families are related and have different cousins serving in different thrones and different capacities. How much do you think jealousy played a part, whether it's between Germany and Russia or Germany and Great Britain or France? How, how do, much do you think that played a role in the leaders and the decisions that they made? So I actually discount the royals altogether. What, what's important to me about the royals, what, what's interesting to me to look at is how little they actually are involved in this process. So everybody in Europe knows if you're in a monarchical system and you're a military leader, you have to get the okay from the monarch. What they're also perfectly well aware of is the monarchs don't actually know what's going on. They don't actually have the information to make the correct decision. So they, they Goldilocks them. They give them one option that's too cold and one option that's too hot and one option that's just right. So what they do is they go as they do in Russia and they say, well, your majesty, you can either not mobilize anything, in which case the Austrians and Germans will attack us and we'll be defeated. Um, you can mobilize only half of your army, in which case we won't be prepared to handle any problems that come up, or you can mobilize the entire army, in which case everything is gonna be fine. And Tsar Nicholas says, oh, okay, if only one of those is just fine, that's the one that I'll do. So I, I'm not a, uh, I don't think the royals play a very large uh, role in this. There's a reason why one outcome of the war is to just get rid of them, get rid of the German Kaiser, get rid of the Tsar, get rid of the emperor in Austria, get rid of the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire. And the reason is the war has shown them to be out of answers and out of ideas. And I think people in the know understood that in 1914 as well. Okay, let me ask maybe the opposite question. How influential do you think were the socialists in this time period and in the political decision-making process? So I was really interested in the socialists um, because they are the largest political party in Europe and they're the only political party in Europe that is meeting across boundaries. So, you know, German socialists are regularly meeting with French socialists, they're regularly meeting with Austrian socialists, um, and they understand that there is a problem with militarism in, or I should say there is a problem of a potential war that's gonna break out in Europe. So they periodically meet and the decision they make is if a government in Europe is conducting an illegal war, conducting a war of expansion or a war of imperialism, the socialists will just shut it down. They'll go on strike and they'll just stop it. So a couple of things were interesting to me about the socialists. One was they didn't think this crisis was worth talking about when they thought other crises had been worth talking about. And then the decision that every socialist party in Europe makes is, because our country is fighting a defensive war, then this theory called syndicalism, which means shutting down the whole system in the event of a war, doesn't apply. So if you're a German socialist, the argument you make is, the cause of socialism is not advanced by letting the Tsar's army run through Berlin. If you're French, the argument is, Socialism is in advance by letting the Kaiser's army roll through Paris. So what every single one of them votes for in the summer of 1914 is to stand by their nations rather than to conduct this syndicalist strategy and just shut everything down. I don't think that means that they had given up on their fundamental ideas. I think what it means is they understood that the wars their countries were fighting were defensive wars. So to me, the, the socialists are enormously interesting and enormously important to understand to what happens in 1914. Okay. Even though they're not in power anywhere. Mm -hmm. Obviously we could keep talking about this for hours. I'm going to end actually with two questions, one about Russia and one about Austria. Uh, the first question is, you know, at the end of the war, obviously Germany takes the blame at Versailles for the vast majority of the war. They have to take, basically claim it was their fault. But do you think that Austria should have held more blame or should have been held more responsible than Germany based on what happens at the beginning? So here's, I think, the problem. And here's where this goes, uh, as the British would say, pear-shaped. Here's where the problem happens. It's, it's perfectly logical to my mind to get to 1918, 1919 and say that the German and Austro-Hungarian regimes were responsible for starting the war. The problem is, 
the Kaiser is in exile in Belgium, in Holland, excuse me, and Holland doesn't want to give him up. The senior leaders of the German military are either dead or have escaped and left Germany. Erich Ludendorff is in Sweden. Um, Emperor Franz Joseph is dead. Um, the senior Austro-Hungarian leaders are either dead or have fled the country. There's nobody that was actually guilty in 1914 that you can blame in 1919. They're all somewhere else. So if the great powers had said, look, we think the Kaiser is guilty, the emperor is guilty, these people are guilty, and we want to hold them for war crimes, I think the European peoples would have been okay with that. What they were not okay with was to say, look, you're all collectively responsible for what happened. So this is why the war guilt clause is such a terrible thing and why it does the things that it does in German history. Because even if you're not a right-wing German, you remember 1914 as, hey, we mobilized because the Russians mobilized on our border. What we did was defensive. So these narratives of 1914 become critically important even after the war. So the, the simple answer to your question is that they were looking for blame in the wrong place. So what happened at the end of World War II is they made the very clear decision, the Allied victors, at least in the West, the Russians didn't do it quite this way, but the British and the Americans made a clear decision to try about 18 or 19 Nazis at Nuremberg and leave the rest of Germany off the hook. Now that in my mind is going a little bit too far the other way, but I understand what they're reacting to. They wanna blame the people who are actually responsible for the war, they don't wanna blame all of society. Okay, and then I'm gonna kind of wrap with a final question. Many of these countries talk about in, in the documents about they're fighting a defensive war, they'll defend themselves. But how can every country be fighting a defensive war? Yeah, it depends on the way that you craft these narratives. So I think the reason, one reason Russia has a revolution is because Russia's narrative doesn't work. It, it becomes very difficult by 1915 for Russia to defend what it's doing as defensive anymore. It just becomes impossible to do. Um, they can do it, I think, because of the way the chain of events plays out. If you're Austria, at least initially, you're defending yourself against an act of state-sponsored terrorism. What happens is that by the time you get to the middle of the of the first month of the war, that's gone. That that nobody cares who shot the Archduke anymore. It's no longer possible for Austria to do that, which puts Austria in a very difficult position. Uh, Germany can do it for the simple reason that Russia mobilizes first. And you know there there are letters that go back and forth between French socialists and German socialists, where the Germans say, "Hey, look, we the Russians are mobilizing on our border. What would you do?" And French socialists write them and say, okay, we understand what, we're, what you're doing. We don't like it, but we understand. The problem I think happens that in the intervening four years, so much hatred gets built up that they can't just go back to the situation they had in 1914. It has to get completely reworked and completely redone. Um, so I think that this notion of fighting a just war in 1914 is really important. Those states that can sustain that narrative are the states that hold together more or less in the first world war. The ones that can't are the ones that come apart. Excellent. Well, I think we could probably stay here for the next four hours, uh, but I think we are going to wrap it there. I want to give a big thank you to everybody for giving up your time and joining us tonight. Please, before you get offline tonight, tinyurl.com slash WWICC feedback. Thank you so much to Dr. Michael Nyberg for being willing to jump on this program that didn't exist and help us create it and make it exist. And a huge thank you to the United States World War I Centennial Commission for entrusting us with this program and allowing us to bring some amazing programs to our teachers all around the world in the course of this year. Keep in mind, keep in touch, look for some more exciting things coming out from National History Day in the next few months. Thank you, everybody. We're going to pause the recording. This recording will be available, and we will be sharing this across our network tomorrow. So thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful evening.